So um, this is what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to introduce the hands-on, hands-off spectrum, which is going to lead us into talking about the different hands-off strategies that you can pursue. And for each of them, we're going to go through what they are, how they work, and importantly, talk about their pros and their cons, because spoiler, no strategy is perfect in property or anything else. And then we are going to end by concluding what the ultimate hands-off strategy is. Ooh, sounds exciting. Okie dokie. So here's a, a spectrum of the sort of, not all the strategies, but a lot of the main strategies that you can do in uh, property investment. So, and there's this there's, there's as well, I'm sure you can think of others like rent to rent and so on. And all of them require a certain amount of either being hands on or hands off. So, to the left, the strategies are more hands on, and to the right, they are more hands off. Um, so, for example, if you do flips, particularly refurbing and then flipping, um, you're the amount of time you will dedicate to that strategy will be intense. There'll be a lot of time dedicated, and that's why it's so far to the left. Refurbs as well, you know, again, a lot of time spent for obvious reasons. HMOs, houses of multiple occupancy, even if you buy one ready-made, um, the management of HMOs is intense. Um, you've got lots of tenants coming and going, coming and going. Um, holiday lets can also be probably fall about the same point as HMOs. Uh, you've got self-managed buy-to-let, which is doing buy-to-let, but looking after the tenants yourselves. Outsource buy-to-let, more on that shortly. Um, Silent JV partner, again, we'll talk more about that, and funds. So we'll talk about all of those. Okay, so let's look through each of these that we've identified. So outsourced by to let, silent JV partner and funds are the ones we're going to look at today because they are the ones that can be somewhat hands off. So we'll go through each of them in turn and talk about what they are and talk about their pros and cons. So let's start with outsourced by to let. So what is it? Well, pretty obvious. It's the typical buy to let model. It's the most standard straight down the line strategy that there is in the whole of property investment, but using a team to take as much work off your hands as possible. When we're talking about using a team to take work off your hands, what are we talking about? Well, there are loads of areas where you can outsource some of the work. So research, if you are trying to figure out what property to buy and where, and or if you even need to um, sort of like arrange viewings and things like that. Well, you can develop a set of processes and give them to a virtual assistant to execute those processes for you. Acquisitions as well. So actually finding um, properties to buy, you can use a sourcing company or you can use an individual to help you find what you end up buying. Management, you can obviously, this is the most easy one to outsource of the lot, use a letting management agent. There are absolutely loads of them. And so that whole part of the job can be taken away. And then finally, sort of tax, accountancy, record keeping, things like that. You can hire a part-time bookkeeper. You can use an accountant to file your tax returns. Um, you could sort of loop the virtual assistant back in here as well to deal with some of the paperwork. So every stage of the process, from the very beginning of trying to work out what you want to buy, through actually buying it, managing it, and doing all the record keeping and the reporting around it, there are large parts of the process when it comes to buy to let that you can actually outsource to a team. So what do you not outsource? What's really advised that you must not do? So virtual assistant to help you research is an incredible um, way to maximize your time, but it doesn't mean you can abdicate from your responsibility of research. So someone can do it for you, but then you need to check it and then come up with your own viewpoint. So they can go and collect lots of information from different places, put it in a report for you, and that could be really useful or shortlist properties for you to consider, but don't let them make all the decisions on your behalf. Let, let them do a lot of the work to allow you to make your decisions at a, you know, a faster pace, but you still have to take responsibility for your research. And of course, that, that you know applies to the you know, research due diligence. So you can work with companies or have your own team help you find deals, but you need to check them. You need to be the one to sign it off because ultimately you know, the funds are yours. And you know, if you're working with a sourcing company or you're working with an individual to, to help you source those properties, you're the one who's going to own it. You're putting your name to it. It is your property. 
So if it goes really well, then fantastic. But if it goes wrong, they're not going to start paying your bills either. So you just need to make sure that you do your research on the people you're working with and then research their research as well. So it does require some of your time and input. Decision making. Again, you're going to get a lot of advice and a lot of people are going to come to you with options and, you know, working with good brokers and letting agents, they will give you options. They will give you suggestions. But you're going to have to make the final decisions and paperwork. Unfortunately, you can't outsource people signing your mortgage documents and things like that. You can, of course, have a virtual assistant who may have some of your proof of ID and things like that to, to speed things up. But ultimately, there is going to be some form filling. There is going to be something that you have to do. You just can't get away from that, unfortunately. That's what outsource buy to let means to us. What are the advantages of that as a strategy? Well, first of all, buy to let is a tried and tested path. This is what we do. Buy to let is what we as focus on as individuals and it's what we focus on in our businesses because it works. It's not the most exciting. You're not going to sort of get many TV shows where all people do is buy a property and then rent it out for years quietly without anything happening. But it really pays off big over the long term. And the long term reward for the effort involved, especially if you're outsourcing large parts of the process, is really spectacular. And you'd be surprised at how many tasks can be outsourced to reduce demands on your time. We listed some of them just then, but if you sit down and think about it yourself, kind of you could use those same categories and just sort of like make a list of all the different different things that need to be done within those categories and then try to think how could each of these tasks be outsourced to somebody else you'd be surprised I think with a bit of creativity at how much you could actually get off your plate also the great thing about this is it's flexible so you can outsource just the parts that you don't want to do so it can be related to time or it could also be related to expertise or just purely what you enjoy there might be parts of the process like maybe doing the research about what to buy in the first place that you absolutely love it and you're good at it it's something that you would willingly spend your time doing almost as a hobby and it's something that nobody else could do quite as well as you could well in that case you can keep hold of that bit and you can get rid of the management for example but then there are plenty of people who are the other way around like they they want loads of help with the research because it's kind of desktop based and they find it a bit boring but actually interacting with people is what they love so they could do it the other way around and the other thing is for all these tasks that we've mentioned it's relatively easy to find specialists to help you there are plenty of companies individuals they're everywhere by by kind of doing a bit of searching by asking for recommendations in your network you can pretty much find someone to do everything that we've talked about and more so it's a it's an easy strategy it's a time-tested one it's flexible and it's easy to get the help you need so it's not all upside right not you know whatever you do whatever strategy you take on in property there's always a downside so what are the cons of outsource by to let well you can't outsource completely as we've already discussed you know you're going to have to do admin and as your portfolio grows that admin grows you know you think about it like even if you have let's say you have 10 properties and your mortgages are two year fixed well then every year you're going to have five properties that you need to sort mortgages out for even with a broker it's going to require some efforts hiring somebody that's not the end of it then you have to make sure you've got the systems in place and make sure that they are doing what you want when you want um you need to have a strong knowledge base yourself as well because as we've already said, you're, you're gonna to need to verify the information that you're being given. You can't do it all on trust. You should trust them, but then verify. This goes for any strategy really, because of, you, know, you, know, you are gonna put your funds in and whether they perform well or not, it's down to you. And the decisions will lie with you. And there are some things you can do where the decisions don't lie with you. And we'll, we'll talk about them shortly. But you need to make sure then the people making those decisions are doing the, the right thing. So by putting your money on the line, you are, you know, hopefully going to take the upside. But the risk is you may take the downside as well. Absolutely. So to summarize, outsource by to let, it's a great option, but it's still not that hands-off compared to other investments like investing in the stock market, for example. So you could 
get rid of as much of the process as you possibly can. But there is still, for the reasons that Rob just mentioned, there's still things to do. If you've got a team, there's managing the team. There's going to be bits of the job that only you can do. There's going to be paperwork that only you can do. And because you are ultimately taking responsibility, you still need to have your own knowledge. So it's a great option. We love it. But it's important to be aware that it's not the most hands-off option in the world. We're actually going to go through two other options now, though, that are more hands-off. So Rob, being a silent JV partner, what's that? Being a silent JV partner is you provide the cash to someone else and then they go and do all the work and you get paid for backing them financially. So an example could be, you are time poor, but you like the idea of refurbs and the potential upside it could bring. You may know somebody who is brilliant at refurbs or building and you know they've got all the trades, but if they're cash poor, you can work with them by you backing them financially and they doing the work and you agree a split at the end. You still are going to have some involvement and we'll talk about that shortly, but ultimately you are the finance person, you're the money person, but you're not the doing person. The most common strategy you see with this though is somebody who does the refurbs and you are the person with the money. Now, there's a few different structures you can use for pursuing a something like this. So one is you split the rental profits. So obviously this only works if you're actually holding on to the property and you're not going to be just start doing a flip or developing something to sell on. But if you are holding on to the property, then a really easy way of making this work is you just split the rental profits between you in some kind of proportion. Another option, if you're not holding on to the property, but you are doing a flip or a development, is that you can earn a fixed return. So you are effectively like a mortgage lender. So you'll give them a sum of money and then either monthly or at the end of the project all in one go, they will pay you a fixed rate of interest effectively on the money that they borrowed from you. Maybe why are they borrowing from you rather than borrowing from a bank? Well, maybe it's because there are bridging finance is very expensive. There's lots and lots of hoops to jump through or maybe they're borrowing for a bank as well, but they need some additional funds in place. But either way, that's one way of doing it. Or a third option is profit share. So maybe there's um, some kind of development going on and then you, you as the person putting in the money get promised a 20% share of the profit that's made in, ret in return for providing the funding or something like that. But what all of these structures have got in common, and you can have hybrids as well, and there's loads of different ways of doing things, but what all of them have got in common is that your role is purely getting paid a return in some kind of format, whether that's rental amount, whether it's a fixed amount, whether it's profit share, getting paid some amount purely in exchange for providing your cash. And it's somebody else who does all the work. Okay, so what are the pros of being a silent JV partner? Someone else does all the hard work. You just provide the cash. Seems easier, right? Um, you get the fun of being involved with a project without all the stress. Um, you can also apply the model to many different strategies and it really can be 100% hands-off if you want it to be. But there are disadvantages as well because clearly if there was a 100% hands-off, no risk, nice and easy, no stress investment, then everyone would be doing it and there'd be no other strategies in property. But that's not the case. Um, the big disadvantage is risk. You need to pick your partner very, 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 very carefully because the entire project is in their hands. That's kind of the beauty of it. You don't want that involvement. You want to be hands-off but that means that the person who is doing it, your cash is completely in their hands. This kind of arrangement is better suited to projects rather than long-term holds. The reason for that is if you're working with somebody who you don't know well, what, what are the chances that you're going to stay aligned for the years and years and years and years that you really that it takes to get the full benefit from a buy to let? It's very unlikely that you're going to stay, stay aligned for that whole time and you're not going to get into disagreements about one person wanting to sell and the other one wanting to hold and all the rest of it. If you do a project that's, say, six to 12 months, far easier to sort of go into that with a clear set of outcomes that works for everyone and that everyone can agree to. The exception to that, I would say, is if you're working with family, where, where I have seen it work, where you've got kind of like long-term buy-to-let holds done between family members. Um, legal agreements must be correct and can be very complicated, but you've got to get this stuff documented. So important and it can go wrong. It's, you can see it go very wrong if your interest is not properly protected, because really the 
the legal agreement and the other person's word are the only protection that your money has in this scenario. So it's so important. And the final con is that you can be 100% hands off, but you probably shouldn't be. Like, if you put your money into something, you should probably be actively monitoring it and asking some questions. And as Rob hinted at earlier, when you are in that situation of finding out the details of the project, that no stress may turn out to go away because all projects are stressful. The only way to avoid the stress is to not know anything about what's going on. And that's probably not a smart move because if there is something that's going wrong, you should really know about it. And so you can try and be in a position to influence it. Position. Okay, next on our list is property funds. So what is a property fund? Well, it's a structure that's set, set up specifically to buy property and then rent it out. You buy shares in that structure. Then the fund pays out the rental profits as dividends. And so somebody manages that structure on your behalf and all the other shareholders' behalf. The value of the shares rises and falls based on the value of the property. So very similar to capital growth. So the dividends is like your rent and the share price is like your the price of the property. If capital growth takes place, then you may see those shares rise and you, you benefit from capital growth that way. Okay, well, there are loads of different types of property fund. There's different structures that some of them vary in a big way. Some of them are just minor differences, but really, the most important thing of all that far more important than anything else is what the fund actually invests in because whatever the nature of the vehicle the underlying asset is still property so you need to be confident in the asset class and this needs to be a type of asset class that you want to get exposure to and there's loads of choice so there's residential property funds not many as it happens but there are some and there are some that have um, that are biased towards one geographical area and others that are the sort of focused more on others so knowing if you want to get um exposure to the residential asset class then that's for you but you need to work out like what the underlying property is actually like you can invest in student properties there are funds that specialize in that there are funds that specialize in social housing or assisted living there are those that on the commercial side do offices there are others that do retail there are others that do logistics and you could break them down by far more subtypes than this as well this is just like the real top level this is critical this is the first thing to, to work out is is like well what do you actually want to be investing in and once you know that then you can zero in on funds that operate in that kind of sector and then start sort of making decisions from there about which is the right one for you. But it all comes back to the property that they hold because ultimately that's where the income and the potential capital growth comes from. Okay, so what are the pros of property funds? It really doesn't get any more hands off. You don't need any particular knowledge or expertise. The people running the fund should have that. And diversification as well between a large number of assets. There are a small number of funds that do buy one asset. They are out there, but the majority buy several assets and many of them buy multiple assets. So the diversification is really strong. If you think about it, if you put all your money into a fund or all your money into one buy to let, then the risk is concentrated in one buy to let, whereas in a fund, it's concentrated across multiple different investments. Generally as well, there's better liquidity than owning directly. Now, it doesn't mean it's instant liquidity. It depends on the funds that you're investing in, but it's normally, you know, offers more liquidity. It normally allows you to get your cash out faster than owning a property directly. And is there can be tax advantages as well. You know, some sometimes you can put your fund uh, through different vehicles to reduce your, your tax. Um, and then the structure of the funds as well can be um, positioned to maximise from a tax point of view. There, there are disadvantages to property funds as well. The first disadvantage is kind of a weird one, which is liquidity isn't always a good thing. And I'll try to explain. If you can see a minute to minute share price, which sometimes you can, it depends on the fund again, but that can be a dangerous thing because it can make you far more emotionally attached to the price of your investment than you should be. So if you buy a property, a buy to let, after you've bought it, unless you happen to have just had it valued for mortgage purposes or something, you don't really know how much it's worth. And you can't suddenly panic and have sold it 
in 10 minutes time. It's just not an option. But with a fund, that could happen. You could see the value go down slightly. You know exactly what it's worth and you panic and sell it when in fact you should have held on to it because that was just a temporary dip. So the, the liquidity can be dangerous and it can also be an illusion because remember the underlying asset is still illiquid. So ultimately the investment is still property and so if you have the expectation of complete liquidity but the reality is that the fund would need to sell a load of property to make that happen that's not always going to work but away from that there are some other disadvantages of property funds one is that you need to put a lot of trust in other people it's the same as all of these strategies. When you're being hands off, it means that somebody else is doing some of the work. If you want to have complete control, then you do everything yourself, but then you can't be hands off. As the minute you start handing bits over, you need to put trust in other people. And with property funds, you are really like handing over a complete control of everything. Somebody else selects what gets bought, what gets sold, how it gets managed, who the tenants are, when, when work needs doing to it. It all gets handled by other people, so you need to trust the people who are actually running it for you. The final disadvantage of property funds also sounds like a weird one. Um, it can be too hands-off. And by that, I mean that there's just no excitement. People get involved in property for lots of reasons, but for many people, one of the reasons, maybe not the main one, but one of the reasons that they're attracted to property in the first place, and they like to sort of spend time on that as an investment, is that they actually enjoy property investment. And if you invest in a normal property fund, then you don't get any of that. It's all done for you. So although you can end up doing very, very well, you kind of lose some of the emotional aspect of it. And it's very easy to go, oh, well, that's silly. I'm a serious numbers investor, but I don't think that's right. I think the emotional side of investing is important. So the question is, how hands off do you want to be? There's no right way of being a hands-off investor. That should be obvious from what we've just gone through. We've talked about three different options. No one of them where we've just gone like, this is it, this is perfect. There is no such thing as perfect. And there's no such thing as perfect for everyone because there may be one of these that's spot on for you, but it could be completely wrong for somebody else who's here today. So there is no right way of being a hands-off investor. But the great thing about property is that there is this whole spectrum and you can choose what works best for you, especially if you go down the, sort of the buy-to-let route where we talked about just how granular you can get with joint ventures. There are so many different ways of structuring it. And I think a really, really important point is that however hands-off you are, you still need to build and maintain strong property knowledge so you can make the right decisions. Or you can, even if even if the only decision you're making is where you put your money or who you trust with your money, you still need property knowledge to do that. If you are being more hands-on than that, and you, you still need to be able to have the knowledge to monitor the job that other people are doing. So with property, really, I think with any kind of investment in anything, you can't just go blindly into it and sort of go, oh yeah, this seems fine, chuck your money in and never think about it again. You can't do that with any investment. You can do it even less with property. So you do need to have that knowledge.